Hello, my name is Jeffrey Hill, and I am here today with Renee Steinhauer, a research scientist who is going to demonstrate for us his experiment, which is called what? This is the Steinhauer Variable Speed Light Experiment. This experiment demonstrates that the speed of light is actually variable and not constant. That is, con that is currently in widely believed in physics People today. People think you can't go faster than the speed of light. Like if you get close to it, like you run into a theoretical brick wall, right? That is the general belief. And so today, this is going to show us that that's not true. That is correct. So that doesn't that change the... I mean, this has something to do with Einstein, right? Where he says that kind of stuff. So it's going to change the whole entire belief. Um, it definitely would uh, destroy the foundations of Einstein's uh, theory of relativity. It uh, definitely uh, has an effect on our understanding of particle physics and the uh, foundations of physics in general. Uh, this is a new discovery that is um, in contradiction to current belief and current research. This experiment has never been done before. This is a new experiment that's been uh, well researched. Um, it's been completed hundreds of times before. And about five years ago, it hit me while I was driving uh, based on other things I've been reading. I'm a ham radio operator that uses radio waves. Suddenly it put it all together. That combination between wavelength, frequency, and the speed of light all being directly related. And in this particular experiment, I actually control the frequency and I measure the wavelength. Now, if the speed of light stays constant no matter what, then nothing should be changing my wavelength. In this experiment, we change between positions in the sky, similar to what was done with the Michelson-Morley experiment, to see if there's a difference in speed based on how our planet is traveling through the universe. Our planet is believed to be traveling at the universe towards a cosmic microwave background at about 63,100 meters per second. Now, now, I know some of you might be saying, he's talking gibberish. Trust me, it's at the edge of my understanding too. But this is not flat earth science. Definitely not flat earth science. It's really based in true science, right? That's correct. In this particular case, what, what I'm looking to do is see, just like a car driving down, driving down a highway, if, you've got a, if it's driving 20 miles an hour, you take a ball and you throw it 10 miles an hour fast from the back of that pickup truck, that ball is now traveling both with the speed of the truck and with the speed that you've thrown the ball. And it now has 30 miles an hour forward speed. Because the ball is traveling in the vehicle at the same speed as the vehicle. Now, if I take that ball and I throw it out the window of the pickup truck, but I want to see which direction, but I want to keep seeing what that forward speed is, the speed of that ball going in the direction of the vehicle, even though it may be going 30 miles an hour this way, if the car is going this way, that ball still has that forward direction, whatever the speed of the ball is. That's true. Right? And even I don't know it's moving away from the vehicle, it's still moving that same direction. Yes. And, you know, obviously with wind, you'll get air resistance and it'll slow down quickly. But we're kind of ignoring that because in space, there's not quite as much resistance. So what I'm looking at is I'm shooting a radio wave at the speed of light. The Earth is our truck. Okay. So we're driving in the truck at a certain speed. Because the Earth is moving like around the sun through yep. space. And it's we're going. not really standing still. Not standing still. And we know that we're going in that direction. Okay. And we've got all the speed with us. And when I'm there at this speed, it shouldn't matter which direction I look. If the speed of light is constant, it'd be like us not moving at all. It'd be always so it, the same. It would be always the same. And that's what they say. The speed of light is always the same. We know when I shoot my antenna and I send this radio signal, it's going to go at the speed of light. So the speed of light is constant. It's always going to be the same. And we know that that wavelength and the frequency will equal the speed of light. If I control the speed of light, if I could, sorry, if I control the frequency and the speed of light changes, the wavelength changes. And this experiment looks for wavelength change based on whether I'm looking down the direction that the car is driving or if I'm looking out the window 90 degrees from it. And it's that simple. 
or in that the car. Really simple. The, pick, the, the, the pickup is the planet Earth, and the ball is a radio wave. And we're throwing it out this way. So we're shooting balls this way, and then we're going to shoot balls that way. Yep. Shooting them this way should add to the speed. Yes. Shooting this way should be the same speed that the planet's traveling at. Yes. So there should be a difference. Absolutely. Our first thing we want to do is get our truck driving in the right direction. And to do that, we have to find the star regulus because the star regulus kind of hangs out right between, right in the middle of um, uh, the cosmic microwave background. So I've got an app that helps you find stars. I've put in regulus. I've got us close to that, but it always is moving. So I need to get that star. You can see that. See the star in there. We'll have to do a close up of this. Yeah, you have actually got constellations on your phone. Kind yep. Of like looking at space, it looks like a horse. Yeah. So uh, we're looking for. All right. Right. The fingertips covering the camera. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, we're, man, we are right on the horizon. That makes life pretty easy for us, actually. Um, so I'm gonna bring this down. Make this almost perfectly flat. And then this lines up, and you can see that the instrument, the, the star, is right there in the middle. Oh, it, you're like right on it. Yep. What we're going to do for this experiment, we're going to take three measurements with this instrument pointing in this, in this direction. Those measurements last 10 seconds, and they get almost about 100, uh, sorry, almost 200 uh, data points where it's saying, all right, what's that, that measurement? 200 times we're going to look at that over the course of 10 seconds, and we're going to record that. We're going to do that three times to make sure that we've got a pretty good idea of what's happening here. Then we're going to take this instrument, we're going to rotate it 90 degrees. So it's like throwing the ball out the window of the car. And we're going to take three more measurements. And just to make sure that this and this aren't complicated by something like thermal variation or something, we're going to switch it back over here, and we're going to do another three measurements. And when that happens, you'll find that your first three and your last three measurements are usually about the same, and your third measurements are either a little high or a little low. It's been taken into an anacone chamber where all RF interference is gone. I saw the pictures. And uh, I was really expecting that. When I did this, in that, that, this experiment in the chamber, it'd be over that I'd have a flat line, that everything would be perfect, and there'd be no any astropic difference. Nope. Still worked. I've worked with extreme thermal variation. So you really thought that you'd go over there and it would fail? Yes. Once I got this to work, my next job was to work to make it fail. I can't bring this out if I don't know that it's good. And That's true. The next you'd role... you quack if you did. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and I'm the only person on the face of the planet who's done this experiment. So the next role is for other people to replicate the experiment. And then once they've determined they've got the anisotropic difference, then they've got to make it fail like I, like I tried. So that's kind of like a challenge. It is. It's to absolutely a challenge. you wrong because today we're going to prove that you're right. Absolutely. The TikTok challenge proved me wrong. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Minus ice buckets. Yeah, minus ice buckets. So, shall we get started before I have to reset the uh, yes. position? Because it doesn't take long for the star to move. And so, uh, we'll go ahead and do this. Just verifying a few things. I can see that I have a signal going. That's what this sine wave is. Very nice sine wave. Frequency here is 16.9999990 megahertz, or 17 megahertz is what I'm transmitting at 10 volts. Right now, we're, we're set up... This particular line right here is a sine wave that shows the signal that is transmitted from signal generator to the instrument and is being measured by that uh, oscilloscope probe that's sticking out of the pipe there. Um, this shows us that we're at the correct frequency. All right, so this line here is showing my frequency, 16.99999 megahertz or 17 megahertz. And this here is showing we have a sine wave there, and we have the maximum voltage coming out, which is between one and a little under one volt. And then we have something called RMS or volts RMS, which is another way of measuring uh, electrical current on a sine wave as well. We're going to actually take measurements from both of those. So the way we do start this, turn on my signal generator. 
and I say that I want, if I can get, if I can see my mouse here, I want the max, and I want the volts RMS, and then I just say we're going to um, one, and and then I assign these names, and then we're going to go for ten seconds. And I just happen to know that by the time those two lines at the very last line that says 10, that's about 10 seconds. There we go. Now we're going to do the second time. Is it important that it's an exact time length? It should be as close to exact, but I clean up the numbers afterwards. Because it doesn't, it won't uh, shut off on its own. Oh. So basically I have to manually delete the last few Thing so that everything ha is exact. All right, so this is going to be okay. And we measure again. And then we're going to do our third measurement. I mean, this really goes very quickly once you're doing very it. Very fast. And I just basically number these so that I know where they're going. And we do it as our third measurement at 10 seconds. All right. And then we're going to rotate this, and I've got this set up so I know exactly where 90 degrees is. And now we've rotated, so now we're going to throw that ball out the window. Instead of forwards, it's going out 90 degrees to the left. To the yes. Right. Okay. In this case, more northward. And we're going to run the instrument again. We're going to do three measurements. Oops, uh, I'm going to get max. And then I just, since it's going towards the north, I hit north, one. And that allows me to make sure that I always know which measurement I'm looking at. Okay, we'll hit that. We'll wait 10 seconds. To my old man eyes, it just looks like a straight line. It should look like a straight line. But you can see there's just little tiny bit of variation little, on the line. Yep, and that's kind of normal for this. The big thing is, what does this line look like when we look at it versus the other line? Oh, because we're going to compare. We're going to compare those two lines. So even though it's flat here, it's still yes. a different measurement there. Yes. Oops, that's north two. North two. Okay. And once we actually start running the measurements, we have to continue the whole experiment fairly quickly or the star moves out of position and you're less likely to get as accurate a result. And that was number because two. Because the earth is turning. Because the earth is turning, yeah. So really long measurements. Um, don't really work out so well for this experiment. I was wondering why only 10 seconds. Now I and am. north. This is our third one, as I recall, yes? I Let's hope so. so. Okay. Another 10 seconds, and we will be done with that. All right. Now I'm going to rotate the instrument back again into the original position. And we're going to throw that ball again straight over the hood of the car, straight forward. Okay. And pull max. RMS. And so on this one will be um, the fourth measurement of 
six. We did three in the beginning, so this is the fourth one in that direction. Did you say that if somebody were to build a full wave length lecture line, they would see a bigger variation? At lower frequencies, yes. But you, <clears throat> you can build a, uh, a higher frequency lecture line and have it completely fit the whole thing fit in there, except that with the equipment I have, I can't get the settings that I need to get the voltage output. It's possible to do. It's just not possible with the equipment I have. Okay, and this is R6, R6, and I believe this will be the I think this last. Is really? You're going to do that, Timmy? I'm not sure. All right, so we can check this out. We should have a total of nine measurements. So with each of the measurements we take, we take nine measurements. Each of the nine measurements will have these results come across. Column A is just telling me which number of, of me which data point it is. Column B is the exact time that data point was obtained. Column C is whatever I've asked it to be. So in column C, um, it says maximum voltage. It. And then uh, column D is the volts RMS. And so what I do with all this is that I then start to bring all this down into a single file where I'm going to copy and paste all that data into a single file, but I'm only interested in the max and the volts RMS. So I delete the first two columns and I save the whole file as, and I just say completed. So it's the completed stuff. And it's got the date and the time that this experiment was done. I have 18, bits, 18 columns of data. Nine of that is max data, and nine of that is the VRMS data. And I would compare all the max data, and I can compare all the VRMS data. Um, the, uh, and you can see it's right here. They're, they're labeled. And actually, if you go to them, you can actually see the smaller I've got one, two, so that I can clearly recognize, did I paste the wrong one in? That's why I put all that extra stuff in to make sure that there's a... So your a, data doesn't get mixed up. Yes. At the bottom here, though, you can see that there's different... Oh, this is what amount. you mean, the time length. The time length. The far left column on the original spreadsheets measured the time, so now you can just simply cut the time to exact the same on all of them. Exactly. So right here... Uh, at 180 uh, data points, we have, everybody has some. So at 181, I'll go down here and I will just delete. And now we have the exact same number of data points for all of these stuff. A couple data points off would probably made a big difference one way or the other in our stuff, but we want to make it exact. And the important thing is, of course, you cut off everything at one spot. You don't bias it and say, well, I'll just take out the high one, the low one. No, that would be bad. Okay, so now what does all this stuff mean? Well, if we're correct and if the speed of light is variable, I'm going to do what's called the box and whisker plot. If speed of light is variable, all these boxes should look pretty much the same. Now, Real life, they don't aren't exactly the same, but they should. If the speed of light is constant, you'll see them all kind of on one line. The speed of light is variable. You're going to see three here, three here, and the mid three are either going to be a little bit up or a little bit down. I'm just going to oh, let me save this before I forget. All right, so just going to highlight all the max. And this is a reading of the maximum voltage obtained during these things. All right, 
hit insert, go here, we do box and whisker, and if you look at this. These are the actual readings? This is the actual readings. So you see these three are obviously much lower than these ones and these ones. Would you agree? 100%. It's very obvious. Yeah. The, um, you can see that this box is a little bit different than that box. That happens. Um, that may be from small amounts of RF interference, thermal change, things like that. Who knows? But it's not enough to, to be the reason for this. This is what we call the enneostropic difference. Oh. Um, additionally, you notice I take three measurements and three measurements again. What if thermal change was causing the measurements to get smaller and smaller? If this was related to thermal change, you'd have these three measurements, you'd have these three measurements, and then you have these three measurements down here low. That would say there is something seriously wrong, and all you're really doing is slowly taking a, uh, a measurement that's constantly decreasing. This says our measurement's staying pretty close to the, the baseline. Yeah, That's yeah, what the I call far the right one is the same yep. point as the, the far left blue one. And this is obviously different. We threw the ball. Huh. It's got a and different the speed. speed. Yep. Whoa. And that's it. It's there's a certain simplicity to this experiment um, that is just mind-boggling in some ways. This this is not a billion-dollar experiment. Which I find interesting. You know. Your background isn't in science, not in this type of science. So you did not, I mean, you could tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm making, a, an, I'm making a, I'm a judgment here. You didn't come to this game with a preconceived notion. No, I did not come with a preconceived notion. Uh, my background is emergency medicine. I worked, uh, started as a paramedic, then eventually a nurse practitioner. Uh, my hobby was physics. I enjoyed reading on things such as uh, you know, relativity and, and lots of different physics. Just uh, a few days ago, I was out visiting the uh, gravitational wave detector in Hanford because it's really cool science. Um, I like science. I really do. But one of the things that's different about me is I don't believe something just because someone says it. Um, you know, you look at... Uh, You're a natural born skeptic. I'm, as all scientists should be. But at some point in science... We're taught certain things that this is the way it is. And, and you begin to believe it. That's yes, just, that's everybody just, else believes it. it. If you've never done the experiment, the experiment that demonstrates or has previously been proof that the speed of light is constant, it's called the Michelson-Morley experiment. There's hundreds of thousands of physicists in this world, probably less than 100 who've actually built the Michelson-Morley experiment and mm. actually done data. Everybody now, else just assumed. They, they took the word. The, their, their physics instructor said, well, this, this was done, and there's the data, and we believe it. Now, I could tell you the same thing. Here's the data, but I'm not telling you to believe it. I'm telling you to buy this stuff off of Amazon or wherever you want to go and do the experiment yourself because this doesn't take rocket science to get this experiment done, and this is... I remember, really that's, big. Why, that's why I brought that topic up. It occurred to me that you're thinking outside the box. And sometimes in our lives, we get stuck in the box. It took someone to think outside the box to see it a different way. There are, sci there are scientists, physicists, um, who have actually been reluctant to write and publish on the subject of variable speed light because they know it is such a controversy. controversy. It's considered heresy in, in physics to say speed of light is variable. Um, and it affects their credibility and that affects their funding for their science. So now that makes me wonder, since you don't come here with a physics background, mm -hmm. are you credible? I'm certainly credible. Will somebody believe I'm credible? That's hard. This uh, research has been submitted for peer review, as all good scientific research should be. I'm hoping it is accepted and published. It's been about six weeks and it has not been rejected yet. That's a good sign. That's a great sign. Um, and then 
assuming it's published, then that's the next thing. But realistically, what it means is two other scientists have looked at this, and the editor is also a physicist, has looked at this and said, well, we think that's good. But will they have actually done the experiment? They've looked at what I've done. They look at the logic. They look at the data. They assume I haven't tried to lie to them about the data. And then they make a decision, hopefully one that's not biased by, oh my God, will they think we're crazy for printing this? But the real validation, we call validating the experiment, isn't the peer review. It's that it's done over and over again. And in this experiment, two things have to be done to validate it. Number one, you have to be able to do the experiment with equipment that's sensitive enough, sensitive enough to get this. So you have to be able to find and observe that anisotropic difference and say, yes, I found it. So is this, because this looks really doggone backyard simple. It's not backyard simple. The sensitivity for this, this is a signal I generator mean, right here. In, I thought that it was just a, a Super Nintendo. Nope. This is a signal generator and um, it's got a 16-bit vertical resolution, which means the 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 fine tuning of this piece of instrument the resolution is pretty high. This is a USB uh, oscilloscope, so the guts become the software that's transmitted down to here. This oscilloscope has the ability to measure up to 16 bits resolution as well. However, in the experimental process, we're only able to get between 10 and 11 based on the settings we have. Um, if I had different equipment that could do different settings, I could go to a higher resolution with this equipment and what I've got. It doesn't make sense to do that when right now all I'm really looking to do is demonstrate this. The standard uh, oscilloscope that you get from any hardware store or, or wherever is 8 bits. If you don't have mm -hmm. 10 bits, you're not likely to get this resolution. You're not likely to get this. Um, and I get between 10 and 11 depending on the frequencies I'm using um, and some of the settings that I'm using. So, so someone with a whole lot more money and a whole lot better equipment could even get better results. Yes. This that equipment... Would simply, you know, enhance your theory. Everything here costs less than $1,000. Granted, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars on a lot of other equipment trying to figure out how to make this experiment work. Almost five years of research doing experiments in crazy ways. Burying the stuff under dry ice. Um, Really? Yeah. To see if ther the thermal, thermal variations and would it affect it. Um, looking at all sorts of ways to try to reduce um, RF interference, only to find that really I didn't need much because it, to matter. it doesn't matter. It's, it's able to do it with this equipment. And certainly there's, there's a lot more that can be done with fancier equipment. And that's going to be after this is validated by other scientists then the next step is starting to use this equipment, this technology, to learn to manipulate what's going on. This is likely a result of what's called the ether, which was uh, presumed to be present in the 1800s. That's why they did the Michelson-Morley experiment. It showed no difference in what we call the anisotropic difference, and that, that suggested also that not only is speed of light constant, but there's no ether. Um, this suggests the potential for the ether, although I'm unlikely, unwilling to say, yes, it absolutely is there. What I can definitely say is the speed of light is variable, but I can't say exactly why. Ether is a good possibility, but I haven't played with it yet. I, that's, that's kind of where I go next is figuring out how do I manipulate this stuff? Because whoever learns how to manipulate the ether, whoever learns how to manipulate this technology, that's the person who's going to the next star system. This changes everything.